They're one hundred percent starting subsonic, just because the bullet does not have the in-flight characteristics to maintain that velocity over any reasonable distance. So if you start below that barrier, you don't have that disruption. You have a higher potential for accuracy. All right, what is up, everybody? Now, when I'm late for a podcast, Jim, sometimes I'll say I'll be there in point two. Like you generally send me a text message, and I'll say I'll be there in point two, mm-hmm. which could be uh, point two seconds, could be twenty minutes, but that doesn't matter because we're talking about point two two today. And that is the 22 LR, the 22 short, CBs, bird shots, all the 22s. We don't have them all here. We got we got a handful here. It'd be nearly impossible to have them all here because there's so many kinds of 22 ammo. Mm-hmm. There are. Across, seemingly almost infinite. Almost Not quite, but infinite. And infinite applications, ones for this, ones for that, target. In 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 structure use for vermin, Ryan. Dipsy got, do's, dipsy don'ts, with, with, whistling <laughs> kitty chasers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With or without the scooter stick. That's like not really an exaggeration. No, here. there's many. Ryan, everybody. I don't I don't think I mentioned that we have Ryan here, which we do, because we have cartridges, so you know, we have Ryan. So Ryan, oh. uh I mean I've got a list here. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So, fourteen just like styles. There's probably more. Everybody's got a 22. If you don't get a 22, and then you can start learning all the different types of ammo and use it for all the different things. And even within 22s, there's also like several, we'll call them unique cartridges. So we have short, long, long rifle. And then I'm going to say stinger because it's kind of a different thing. Yeah, I wrote and, that down. And within, within those, like within short, you have short blank, short... CB, you know, short standard, short high velocity, and then long, long CB, so on and so forth. Stinger's kind of its own thing. We don't have Stinger, but we have Hypervel from Aguila, which is pretty much a Stinger. Mm-hmm. What's the deal with some of them are interchangeable and some of them aren't? You know, if you have a 22 LR, you can maybe shoot other stuff out of it, but if you got yeah. the other stuff, you can't necessarily shoot a 22 LR. I, I, like, what? What's well, up with that? So let me let me add to that real quick here, Jim, because I've got two things written down here that I feel like are connected. Maybe they're not, but I I feel like I read 22 long. You you, you hear uh, 22 LR? You yeah. hear that a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then, is there also just 22 long? Yeah. Or is it, okay? Yeah. It's not just an abbreviated long no. rifle. No. Like it's if 20- you said 300 short. You're yeah. really, we all know you're talking about the wisdom, right? Right. But so, what if what if he's talking about short action ultra mag? Right. Exactly. That's the problem. Let's start with the just the the difference between twenty two long rifle and twenty two long. I feel like maybe are those the two most common that get used? No, or? I'd probably say it's shorts and long rifles. Right. Like longs are kind of this ambiguous in between. It's, okay. Yeah, they're weird. Yeah, and it's it's case length, and then with case length, powder charge, and then sometimes bullet weight. Okay. Yeah. So, like, if you look at a short, so on the table here, I don't know if I should touch these because they're so well organized. We have a short CB in the middle. Mm -hmm. Um, So, CB stands for conical ball, um, but CB in the middle here. Um, It's a short case. It's this super cute little diminutive case. And then bracketing it on the sides are traditionally, like, standard length cases, with the exception of this hypervel round, which is closer to like a stinger case. You'll notice it's ever so slightly longer than the other long rifles on the table. Okay. But a long is the stopgap between short and long rifle. Um, so just a little extra case length and then a little more powder and then a possibly different bullet. Was I right in saying that you can shoot like 22 shorts, you can shoot out of a 22 long rifle, Yeah. Right? So like people do that. Yeah, think of it also like if you have a 327 Federal, you can shoot 32 H and R and 32 short, or if you have a, a 357 Magnum, you can shoot 38 Special or 38 short Colt. Okay. So it's it's the same chamber in a long rifle, but a shorter bullet okay. or cartridge put in there. Can you also shoot 22 long mm-hmm. and a 22 long? Okay. Yep. That so makes sense. so if you have a long rifle, you can shoot short, long, long rifle, and Stinger. So that's why long rifle is generally or oftentimes what you see because it's oh, just absolutely. the do-all. Yeah, yeah. Modern 
22 shorts. I'm, I'm aware of, I think, one. Um, and that's a North American Arms Mini Derringer. And okay. they, make, they make a short-only version of it. That you Very answered my next question. I'm like, is anything chambered just in 22 short? I think that's the only one. Um, I, I'd have to look around, but again, like, I'm not going to go out and like I wouldn't buy a rifle only chambered in 22 short unless it was like an old, old, old pre 1900s, like a gallery gun, right? Um, where you could find them only in 22 short. Um, that little revolver, which is adorably cute, it's like barely larger than the dial on my watch. Um, is chambered only in 22 short. They I bet make, it's even still kind of snappy. Yeah, they Those, make them. They make them in long rifle as well. Like I have one in long rifle, but the short is is just like, ah, oh, we got the tooling. Let's make this adorable thing <laughs> that, that you you could like swallow in a in a you know panic if you needed to. <laughs> what so. happened? I swallowed my pistol. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that sounded terrible. It did. I'm I got in, scared. I'm I in in dropped it. it. Yeah, I'm You're in, in, it. in the you best of it. ways. Um. How do we start? We should just start with some more standard long rifle stuff and get into the really wacky stuff. Yeah. Right? So what we, there's a couple of examples here on the table. Ryan's already alluded to them, but but we've got uh we've got I I know I brought along a few of mine, the stuff that I shoot out of my twenty two ARs. We've got some subsonic stuff. I even brought along some more precision type stuff. I don't think I have even the best of the best that's available on the market today, but this is Lapua uh, sorry, Lap what whatever. Midas plus. Um People are doing a lot of stuff with the regular 22 LR nowadays. Oh, I was on the phone with Trent and Brandy this morning talking about 22 long rifle. Oh yeah, hey Trent, what's up? 400 yards is his objective. Yeah. Yeah. And people are even—I mean, like 400 yards—that's a heck of a poke with these things. And people are even going crazier than that. I've seen sometimes. As of two years ago, you can fairly easily reload 22 long rifle. Oh my! Mm-hmm. Hell of a time to be alive. We, we, you, and you say you say reload? <laughs> yeah. Like. You can buy primed cases. Okay. You you put a few select pistol powders in them in very small charge weights, and then you can get lathe turned bullets. Okay, so you're not reloading the one that where like the case flew out of your gun empty, and then you're gonna pick that up off the ground and and reload that. Probably right? not, but you could. You would have to make sure though that you're gonna have the bullet's gonna present itself or the case is gonna present itself such that the the hammer would hit it and the not yet hit side, right? Well, so exists a very small handful of machines that you put a 22 LR case in and you run a special um, like rounded mandrel goes down and pops the rim out and then kind of irons out that uh, primer strike on the rim. Yeah. And then you run it through another operation, which then reforms the case head and then you reprime it using a special priming compound, which I don't know if it's even available or if you have to make it, um, using a pipette or an eyedropper or something like that. And then if you really wanted to go down the rabbit hole, you get a really fast spinning table and the centrifugal force pulls the priming compound to the rim. You're not just making this up as you're No, I swear to God. Like, this is real. (laughs) I've seen one of these machines. It is... It's real to me, damn it. (laughs) so, So this is the coolest thing. This machine... It was hand built. Um, I can't remember the name of the guy that built it. Uh, I'll have to look back on that for sure. But it was a hand built machine. It was about this big, and it had those stages in it. These little hand built dies, like a little arbor press handle, for it. So it popped the rim out, reformed the rim, and then seated the bullet. And then I think it had a crimp function too, like a very subtle crimp function. The opposing side of the machine would take a twenty two long rifle case swage it in a fashion that if you took lead core or lead wire and put it in the middle and then put it into the second part of this die and formed it down, you got a 55 grain FMJ for your 223. What? Yep. So you use the case as the jacket and then you put lead core in the middle, you swage it down and you got a 55 grain FMJ. The extents people will go to to make stuff is really honestly incredible. I mean, it I is. never even count it out anymore, you know? It There's is. There's some odd billion amount of people on this world, and they all have their own little unique interests. And I mean, it's just... Well, Jim, case in point, <laughs> you just welded together a flatbed for a pickup. Yeah. I th- always thought that was a pretty normal thing to do, though. You're the only person I know that's ever done that. <laughs> it looks great, <laughs> some though. Some other people have. It looks great. Thank you. 
Um, but yeah, so this is just, I mean, people have gone, especially as of late. Now, now I don't want to act like 22LR had not been popular until recently because that's false. It's been, it's been around forever. Uh, and it's been very popular forever. But I do, I do feel like a lot of people were like really recently, especially with the precision rifle stuff, they're getting into it and you're seeing all kinds of factory available, like precision stuff Mm -hmm. like we have here. People are starting to shoot out of the, the AR platforms. Uh, more now that the conversion kits are really nice, it's pretty cool. Oh, Which yeah. actually, a, a little plug, Jim. We did that previous podcast all about twenty-two LR ARs. Yes, it's really good. Absolutely. Check it out. Yeah, go check that out. Um, yeah, but I mean, you, you can get astounding reliability and accuracy and all that good stuff out of them. Um, the ones that we have here on the t- like Ryan, I'm curious though, like what is it that a manufacturer has to do differently with this various type with these with this ammo to make it applicable to a certain to a certain use case? Sure. Like what's different between my what do we have here? This is the this is the 22 LR CCI AR tactical. This is just like range plinking ammo, uh, 40 grain bullets here. And then versus, you know, up here we've got the the Midas stuff, or then, of course, there's the subsonic stuff, which is a little bit self-explanatory. What are they doing differently between them all? Sure. So between them all is a big one because there's a ton. We have, we have like 1% of that's mattering. A lot of this comes down to um, bullet shape and style and then loading practice and powder charge. Um, so like looking, okay, the AR tactical stuff, copper plated round nose, it's got a little copper wash on the bullet. We're not getting so much lead deposit. And I, we don't have that one on the table, actually. Yeah, we should get that out. We don't? No, we're no I thought we did, my bad. Uh, pluck one of those out of there. We're going to look at that that projectile. Groovy. There it oh, is. Oh, yeah. Yep. So it's got a pretty round nose, right? So when you look at it compared to um, even just this, uh, Lapua next to it, or no, this is the Lapua here. It's yeah. actually, it shares a profile most similar to the Lapua. Yeah. Um, and these are super subtle differences, like very round nose, like, like almost ball shaped, it, 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 you know, so it, it's designed to feed well, um, in a semi-automatic platform, which, you know, this is what it's design intent is, right? Um, so we're, we're going to improve the feeding and the reliability and the muzzle velocity on it's 1200. So it's kind of a spicy load. Um, from a 22 long rifle perspective. So it's going to generate enough force to, to move the bolt carrier on a lot of those 22 LR conversion guns or 22 LR standard guns. So like I'm intimately familiar with the Nordic NC 22 because I worked there for a long time and, and we had a really heavy bolt carrier and, and, you know, really stiff springs in there. Um, you needed some pretty snoozy ammo to overcome that, right? Some subsonic stuff would run in it or some standard velocity stuff, I should say, would run in it. Most of the time you found best results using like a, a 1150 to 1250 foot per second load. Um, and then depending on the feed ramp geometry, you know, certain certain rounds would either deform the bullet as they were running up the feed ramp, we'd scrape lead off them, um, which of course is going to be detrimental to accuracy, but we're also going to then end up with a lead deposit um, at that feed ramp to chamber transition or like floating around the chamber area uh, or the ejection port area. Um, and then you can run into, you know, like reliability long term. Um, so a, a projectile like that, that is copper washed or plated, um, and then it has that nose cone geometry, very likely they're doing it for feeding reliability, um, you know, and, and just round, round over round over round going in, coming out, going in, coming out, and unimpeded. Um, when you look at some of the other stuff, though, like when we get into kind of the more specialty things, well, actually, let's just go down the, the line here. So we look at the Lapua, the Midas. Um, some of the best 22 LR ammo in the world, like Olympic level ammunition. Uh, their SDs, when you put them on a chronograph, when you're shooting them in a good gun, the, the SDs come out as good as any match centerfire could. I mean, we're talking like single digits, absolutely capable um, ammo. The stuff is just wild how well they control the loading procedure on it. The idea is, of course, there are Olympic sports that are 22 games, like biathlon, for instance. Consistency is key when we're when we're working with such diminutive powder charges, inclement weather, um, you know, all these little variables. A lot of these shooters are running iron sight guns. Um, they need every ounce of accuracy they can get, and it starts at the ammo uh, and then finishes at the shooter. So their their procedures and their processes in loading are are so dialed. Even the 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 wax or the oil that they put on the bullet is like special. Hmm. Um, to allow for feeding, um, 
consistently and, and, and to keep the, the firearm moving. Um, a lot of the guys downstairs that shoot like the NRL 22 and, and our 22 league, they shoot a lot of the center X stuff, um, <clears throat> SK standard, uh, Wolf Match, if, if they can still find it, Wolf Match Extra. Um, and, and all of that stuff is geared towards hyper accuracy. And hyper accuracy is probably an understatement. Um, Taylor just put together a Rim X and put together a group yesterday that I don't know that I own a center fire rifle that's capable of shooting to that degree of accuracy. Um, Jeez. Uh, At what range was he shooting? 100 yards. And with factory? Yeah. Uh, sh- ammo? Yeah. No, he, nice factory ammo. Yeah, he was shooting yeah. SK um, standard or SK plus. Yeah. Um, and it's like we've got a range certified or range certification targets which are, it's a 0.65 MOA center, and it's like three within the yeah. confines of that. Um, and it's just wild how, yeah. how good they do. And, and again, that, that's just a testament to the, um, you know, the, the loading procedures and, and practices in it, where we're weighing powder charges, we're weighing cases, we're weighing primer compound, we're weighing bullets, put them all together, and you get this just outstanding Hmm. result um what's the deal with the what's the deal can i butt in and ask the shape of 22 long rifle and well just rim fire 22 bullets like this is supposed to be you know hyper accurate and all mm-hmm. that good stuff it looks just like of course like we mentioned the ar tactical stuff over here which is more just designed to feed yep. function and, and yep. be range stuff um but you know, this is this is the style or a, a similar look to the bullets. Even this more pointed one over here, which we'll get to, I'm sure, at some point. It's not really like a nice sharp point like you see with center fire cartridges and bullets. Um, what, like, why do they do that? Why don't they have bullets that look more like what Point, you're used like to? Like pointy bullets? Yeah. Well, so the biggest reason is probably just the composition of the projectile, which is just lead. So pointing lead, like to a point, lead being extremely soft deformation is very easy to do, right? So if you had a, a very pointy lead bullet and we just put some pressure on it, we're going to deform that tip. Yeah. Um, so part of it, I'm certain, is that. Um, the other part is convention, right? So what's interesting about 22 long rifle, they're, they're kind of like a healed bullet. So we have the driving bands on the outside of the bullet that are the same or ever so slightly larger diameter than the actual case itself. The case grabs onto the driving or the heel of the bullet, which is then recessed. So if we pulled one of these bullets, we can if you want, yank one of them out. You're going to see um, there's a there's a I've got a, a ton of those things. An exterior diameter, and <laughs> then that old thing. Then there's like an interior diameter. So I'm going to do this without, or I'm going to try to do it without deforming the bullet too terribly much. There we go. We are now performing some 22 LR surgery on the podcast. That's a first. So. I did squish the bullet a little bit, but you'll see you have the, did I do a side that just didn't get absolutely smashed? Kind of. You have the driving bands out here. So mm-hmm. that's actually what's going to engage your, your lands and grooves, your rifling. And then there's the heel of the bullet that goes inside of the case. And then that's what controls the crimp function Okay. or, or holds it, allows it to, to stay in place. And then of course, this absolutely minuscule powder charge. Pour, pour that out. It would be cool if we get in there, if we can see the priming compound. So you're looking at about a grain and a half to two grains That's of That's adorable. Yeah, there is something green yep. down in there. So conventionally, the priming compound is green. So another thing, and this was a cool conversation that I had at SHOT Show with one of the um, uh, delegates from Ely, who also makes Olympic-level um, you know, match 22 ammo. And we, he and I just got bopping around talking about 22s. This was a few years ago, and it was right when... Um, the reloadable 22 LR situation came about, and we had 22 long rifle that we could reload. We got talk about talking about what is the recipe for success, and he said, of course, the bullet's very important. Of course, the powder charge is very important. Of course, the case geometry is very important, the lubricant on the bullet. But he thought that absolutely the thing that separates, um, you know, the the shooters on the on the podiums are the cases priming compound application thereof and how even it is. And interestingly enough, rim thickness. Um, and you wouldn't think about that, right? But, but the, the, the more minuscule I see cases get to a degree, you, you, you pick up this inherent forgiveness in it. Right. And then you go smaller yet. And then like the subtlest changes, to case geometry, powder charge, bullet shape, weight, et cetera, make the biggest differences. Well, it's like a game of percentages, as cliche as that old saying is. Because you're just, yeah, there's less there. Yeah. 
So he and I got chatting about priming compound and how, if you look in that case, mm-hmm. does it look like it was just kind of haphazardly dropped in there? Well, a little bit, yeah, because I'm noticing that there's some priming compound even up uh, near the top. Yep. Uh, and that it, you know, so it's not all down there uniformly in the bottom. Did it? St- did it start there, or did it move when you were tapping it? No. Uh, so the, it the, seems like it's pretty almost like it looks almost like a paste or something. Like a, exactly correct. So the compound goes in in a, a pretty vitreous form or like a liquid form, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's a couple different ways to do it, from what I understand. Um, like that that rotation, that spinning is mm-hmm. one way to do it, where it's going to drive through centrifugal force that compound into the rim, and it's going to do so evenly. Or they're just kind of blotted in, right? So when when that priming compound, as you can see, it's crawling up the wall a little bit. Imagine upon detonation, that compound lighting, and then not lighting evenly. Yeah. Right, so we we now have ignition at the rear of the case, and then that ignition crawls up the wall of the case, and it's lighting the powder charge at in in different Differently, ways yeah. and in different intervals, round around around. This is where we're going to see SDs increase, and this is where we're going to see accuracy decrease, right? Potentially, um, you know, if it's if it's a you know really good gun, maybe it, it doesn't show it so badly, but he was adamant that the priming compound is is truly like the biggest measure of success like how it's done and how consistent and how even it is dictates how good that ammunition shoots it does make sense like your burn rate theoretically in my mind you know could be very different oh yeah what's the what's the volatility of priming compound versus you know the powder that's in the case way more volatile right way more volatile that's what i would assume yeah so like you can take that that gunpowder there and or that uh, smokeless powder, and you can smack it with a hammer, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Of course, you know what happens when you hit a 22 long rifle with a firing pin with only a few foot pounds of energy, bam, it goes off. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, priming compounds way more volatile. Okay. Um, and I can't remember what that's called when, when you strike something like under compression, it ignites. There's a thing for it. You're a diesel guy, you should know this. Yeah, I should. Yeah, okay. <laughs> whatever it works, I don't know. <laughs> whatever whatever the compound is when struck or when you know subjected to intense pressure at at some sort of rate or speed or focused point, then it ignites. Um, of course, the the powder itself requires heat to ignite and burn, right? Um, so the rim thickness thing was something else that was really interesting. Hornady makes at least at, at the time of this recording, I still think they do. I have one a rim thickness gauge. And so he and I start talking about this rim thickness being a huge thing. And he says, I'm telling you, man. And he he was from the UK, so he had just this lovely accent. He said, go take your junk 22 ammo Mm -hmm. and sort it by rim thickness. He goes, you're going to find that your individual firearm has uh, like a, a, a propensity to favor thick, intermediate, or thin, one way or the other. Like your gun's going to do it. Um, sort them out by rim thickness and test the lots. See what you find out. It's I mean, all, what what is that tool? Is it just like this tiny little baby calipers? So or it's like a, yeah, it's a device. The best way I can describe it is a puck with a cone on top of it. So the cone is inserted to the puck. The puck then attaches to your dial or digital caliper. You insert the case and you make a measurement. Okay. So when when the caliper is closed on the top of the cone and it's indicating on the cone, I set my caliper to zero. And then I measure the rim thickness, and what I'm doing then is sorting by, like, a, a thickness range, like plus minus .002 or whatever. Um, and so I did this, and I had, like, seven acro bins in front of me. And I'd hit one. I'm like, okay, well, that rim thickness is .122, okay? It goes in the 122 bin. That one's 125. goes in the 125 bin. And I did this, and I filled up these acro bins. And I started shooting them, and absolutely, like, no question about it, my gun favored rim thicknesses on the lower end of the scale to, to a degree where I was taking bulk ammo and specifically um, federal auto match, AM22 is the skew. And it was shooting not unlike match ammo out of my gun. Oh, wow. Yeah. And to, to a point where I was shooting this gun enough that if I didn't sort, <clears throat> and I was always trying to figure out like what makes a flyer, if I, I thought, well, maybe it's the way I'm running the bolt into the, the chamber and I'm like tagging the bullet on the feed ramp on the way up or, you know, I, I haphazardly loaded it into the magazine, something, right? 
I could close that gun on a proud rim, and you could feel it. Like you could feel the okay. cam, the cam force increase on the bolt, and that round would be a flyer every single time. Do you think that it was almost such that you had shot so many of the good ones, so to speak, out of that rifle that the rifle? Do you think it was you noticing it more, or do you think that the rifle almost the more you feed it the stuff it likes and you avoid feeding it the stuff that it doesn't like, that it almost just becomes like better tuned to that? No, I think that I had. I didn't have an explanation for what the flyer was. I was told the rim thickness dictates success. Oh, and then you saw it. And then I saw it. Okay. And you just can't help but not, you can't help, you can't not see it yeah. once it's occurring. Okay. Got it. So effectively what's happening is we're kind of pulling it out of headspace, right? We're creating, we're creating kind of a, a, a larger jump that that projectile has to do. Like as it's pushed out of the case by the propellant, now we have this kind of free bore situation where the bullet could theoretically cant or yaw, or we'd have an interesting pressure curve change, and then it's slamming into the lands and grooves, obturating, and then going. Would down it actually range. have less jump? Because don't twenty twos actually they they like they like index up against the rim mm-hmm. when they go into the chamber. Yep. So if it's a thinner rim, wouldn't it put the bullet out a little bit further? Less jump, thicker rims, which my gun threw as flyers. My projectile or the driving band on the projectile is further, more. Oh jump. yeah, okay, yeah. I'm following. Yeah, so my flyers were proud rims. Okay. Um, the th- the smaller side of the rim um, measurement yielded oh, better okay. accuracy. Yeah. Results. So there, yeah, therefore your rifle liked a little less jump. Right. Okay. And it was wild because like, I didn't even, I didn't even put that into the equation. Like I was just like, oh, it's bulk ammo, it's junk ammo, it's not going to shoot good. I was very wrong. It was, yeah. it was more than that. It was, it was the case geometry itself that then made a big difference um which was really cool it was it was super neat to see and um it's not like i i don't compete with a 22 long rifle and it's not like i would tell people like oh you don't need to buy that midas plus let's go buy that auto match it's just as good no it's not like that like midas plus is it's a whole different league right okay so let me and i don't we're, we're a little down a rabbit hole now we'll get back but let me ask this question okay? 22s were good for rabbits too uh yeah Ooh, there we go yeah. very applicable okay so the nice stuff, like the the expensive stuff, the you know, like this minus on the table, some of the other ones that you've mentioned, they're one of their claims to fame is they're making things very consistent, right? So you're you're more likely to get the same thing every time you pull the trigger and therefore more predictable, all that stuff, very accurate, high quality. What if they are very, very consistently making something your gun doesn't like? And, you know, then there's no chance that that ammo is really ever going to work well with your gun because yep. it's always consistently not what your gun wants. Very possible. Just just like we see in centerfire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So when I'm doing a, a low development cycle for a cartridge, you know, and I'm testing a, di- a, a whole bunch of different bullets, different shapes, weights, uh, construction, like homogenous versus, you know, traditional cup and core. Like each gun has a, a, a favor, I guess, to, to a particular type of bullet or placement of that bullet in the case relative to lands and groove. So my, my jump, right? So some of my guns love a ton of jump, depending on the bullet that I'm shooting. Some of my bullets need zero jump. Like I, I almost need to, you know, smash them into the lands, which I don't like to do, but it just depends. And I think if you talk to a lot of the guys that are like actually competing with 22 LR, um, there's probably a, Hey, this is probably going to work in your gun situation. There's always a a validation Mm -hmm. period. And somebody finds like, oh, this particular gun favors this particular ammo. Um, Trent actually and I were talking about an uh, interesting feeding issue that he was having with one of his rifles, which is a very high-end gun. And it's the bullet shape and the rim, presumably rim diameter, um, and then the whole package at round five and six, he will always have a misfeed if he shoots that ammo. As, he, as he's cycling the bolt, it will always misfeed. It will never not misfeed. It shoots phenomenally well, but it doesn't feed at five and six. It doesn't <laughs> matter what magazine he's running, the factory magazine, the aftermarket magazine. And it doesn't matter if he puts 10, 11, or 12 rounds in the magazine. Yeah, It always misfeeds at five and six, which is <laughs> very wild, right? He changed the variable. He went to a different ammunition. Psh, works fine. Shoots good, too. That yeah. is crazy. Yeah. Get, getting back to what you were saying before about center fires. I mean, we experienced that with my... Um, a bolt six five Creed. Yep. The other day, I had one type of ammo that I thought was going to shoot great, and and it, I think it probably will out of somebody else's gun. But we were getting what minute, one, minute and quarter. I'd, I'd even say minute and a half. Yeah. 
Then we put in like more of a, a target style ammo, and you, Mark uh-huh. shot Mark shot the staple out of the target twice. Those are your six five one. Yeah, just that, just that old okay. A bolt six five Creed. But it just it just goes to show. Like in my head, I'm like, oh gosh, is it, is it the gun? Is this gun? I, I know this gun has shot well before. Like what's going on there? They're like trying to figure out these different variables. Yep. It's just like something else. Yep. Ammo is a wild thing. I got a question. Yep. It appears to me that okay, like look at Jim's got the you know the CCI. 22 LR uh, copper plated, and, and to me, like the copper plating, I'm like, oh, that's extra. That's that's an extra step. It's less fouling, uh, higher quality, right? But then I feel like in the target stuff, like precision, target, biathlon, whatever, it's just standard lead. Yeah. What's going? Because I in my head, I'm like, well, wait. You don't want fouling. You don't want, you, you know, so what are, are you those, want, they're like, the lead is more accurate, but they have to clean their gun more? Or possibly. You want a, more features. A couple, uh, you yeah. know, so the, I think a big part of it is that, right? So if you were, if you were just looking for 22 long rifle ammo and you hadn't had in your head this notion that these hyper accuracy loads exist or whatever, and you're looking on the shelf and you see a basic lead bullet or you see a bullet that's, Got shiny copper on it. I want that. Yeah, correct. I think a, a part of it's marketing. The other part of it is a lot of these copper plated bullets that you find or copper wash bullets are higher velocity. Mm-hmm. The idea here is we're we're not going to vaporize and deposit lead in a barrel, perhaps, um, to the degree that we would if it was coated in copper. Oh yeah. okay. Yep. Yeah, that's the other thing that I find interesting. A lot of like the hyper accurate stuff is lower velocity. Yes, absolutely. Which seems... Oftentimes even just straight up subsonic. Yeah, uh, most is, like 1050, 1075. Right, because you don't want to yep. be going through the transonic crap. That's exactly why Especially they do when you're, you know, like with a 308, you know, you start going transonic between 800 and 1,000 yards yep. or so. If you just basically start at transonic with a 22 and you're shooting yep. within 100 yards, the yep. whole thing is going to be a mess out yep. to the target. Yeah, Correct. So you'd have a very short period of time in which you're supersonic, and then almost immediately you enter transonic. Yeah. And and that's exactly why they do it. So when you see like standard velocity, which is an interesting thing, so that, that term, standard velocity, um, 1050, 1075, some, somewhere in there, right? High velocity is anything over it. Okay. But when we think about high velocity, we're not thinking like 1,250 feet per second being high velocity, right? But in, in relative terms, when we're talking about 22 long rifle, it absolutely is. Um, and when you look at these shooters, biathlon, um, the uh, positional pistol, target pistol kind of shooting, um, or the NRL 22 or the PRS 22, or these guys that are doing this king of point two mile, which I think is just the greatest thing ever. Right. Oh, that is funny. Yeah. Um, they're 100% starting. Subsonic. Yeah. Yeah. Just because the bullet does not have the in-flight characteristics to maintain that velocity over any reasonable distance. So if you start below that barrier, you don't have that disruption, you have a higher potential for accuracy and and probably more consistency on the velocity side of the house anyways, because we're not trying to stuff a ton of powder in there. Yeah. Um, I, I would have assumed that like the uh, i guess lower velocity lower velocity like target st- target style stuff would have been like for the close range stuff and that the the long range guys would be like well hey i more juice i need the gas sure. you know, i need more juice yeah and i mean yes and no i mean in this case no yeah. if, if you're talking about bringing your 308 to 1200 yards you're going to want to start hot with a very slippery bullet that can maintain that velocity out there um, and and keep you from hitting that transonic region uh, where you're going to run into that sonic instability. Um, but for the guys that are doing this, that are that are shooting to you know four even 500 yards with the 22 LR, they're I think all shooting yeah. standard velocity ammo. They don't ever run into the problem. Speak, yeah. Speaking of slippery in a different way, you brought up uh, lubrication. Yeah, waxes and oils. And what are those things doing? Because like. You know, my regular center fire stuff, to my knowledge, doesn't have that. No, no, it would be a detriment at that. Yes, because now we've got a thin film of something that's creating uh, like a hydraulic force. When yeah, we're, more pressure. Yeah, we're we're 
you know, subjugating the, the cartridge and the rifle to huge pressure, huge pressure, 65,000 PSI, 63,000 yeah. PSI. So why here? Um, or why here sometimes? Or are all of these? Are they all? Uh, to a degree, right? So wax, 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 kind of a waxy oil. I mean, you can see the sheen on it. Oh, definitely. In the light. And you can yeah. scrape, like, you can scrape it off. Like, if you if you grab this here, let me just kind of. There's your wax. Son of a bee sting. Yeah. Which one was that? That was the sniper subsonic. Oh yeah, I like those. Yeah. Um, so, facilitation of reliable feeding, lubrication, right? That's part part of it. Um, and then. I would imagine, and I'm going to step out on a limb because I don't know the actual answer. Like, nobody's told me they are lubricated with this because of this. These are not that far from black powder. Like, when we when we think about black powder guns. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I shoot a patch and ball, 54 caliber gun. Um, it has a favoritism for different types of lubrication. Either a spit patch or mink oil. And pretty much nothing in between. Or at least not that I've tested um, I'm certain other things are going to work for it, but like spit patch or mink oil. What about lanolin? Uh, would probably work. I don't know. I'd have to give it a whirl. A couple things happen with that. I'm, of course, lubricating and I'm allowing for, you know, ease of loading as mm-hmm. I'm running the patch and the ball down the bore, but I'm also cleaning it when I fire it. Like it's, oh, it's, uh-huh. it's softening up the crud that's in there. Upon ignition and obturation, I'm wiping and I'm going to use that word very loosely because my bore still looks like a sewer pipe after five or six rounds. Um, I'm wiping the bore out, and I'm getting that crud out of there, softening and cleaning it, and I'm allowing to shoot more consistently more often. And so my muzzleloader, that particular gun anyways, like shoots unreal, shoots just famously until it doesn't, and then I have to clean it. So with the right treatment on the projectile, um, we can effectively do the same thing super low tech cartridge um you know doesn't have a gilding metal or solid copper jacket is using smokeless powder but is kind of dirty when we look at like the bullet right we, mm-hmm. we've got to do something to, to keep that bore rejuvenated okay yeah and to protect it from oxidization right yeah makes sense yeah we uh we're talking about you know kind of like the lower velocity stuff for target so and maybe I should lump these together. Maybe I shouldn't. So you tell me. But you know, you've got things like uh, 22 LR hyper velocity. Yep. Yeah, 22 LR mini mag. Yep. And then uh, stingers, like CCI stingers. Yep. Are those all different names for the same things? No. So I'm gonna lump the hyper vel and the stinger into the same category. Okay. They're almost a different cartridge. Like we have 22 short, long, long rifle. We should also have stinger hyper vel. Um, because the case is ever so slightly longer and then they make the bullet shorter and lighter so that we don't exceed cartridge overall length and Mm -hmm. we can still, you know, safely shoot it in the gun. So smaller pill, bigger case, going faster. Yeah. So if you remember way back when, when we did the 17 or the, the, the micro diameter little bores, we talked about 17 Mach 2. Yeah. So you you can get an interchange kit for some twenty two long rifles that you do, all you do is swap the barrel and you run seventeen Mach two. It's not a twenty two long rifle case. It's twenty two Stinger case. So slightly longer case, neck down, to to handle that little pill. So the hypervel that we have here, if we put it next to a twenty two LR case, you'll see that the hypervel case is oh. ever so slightly longer, barely. But the bullet's much shorter. And the cartridge overall length though is the same. Yep. Or close to. Yeah, very, very close. Yeah, yeah. pretty close. A little yeah. bit of nose profile difference there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that hypervel case is pushing that projectile remarkably fast. Like, I don't know if they put them on this box. It's a pretty old box. Some of these things will get up to like the 1,500 foot per second range, and I think a couple of them even got a little bit higher than that into some insanity levels. Um, you know, and, and really specialized loads, right? So the... I'll tell you from experience, they're generally not the most accurate, but they do things a little bit different. So if you're looking for a small game load or a a varminting load um, or a pest control load, and you need a little more wallop than what a standard 40 grain lead round nose is going to do, those do it. Yeah. And they do it well. It appears as though they had a very uh, specific intention for these bullets back in the day when they made them. Pumas? Pumas. (laughs) (laughs) So if you're going to hunt pumas, or just cats. Yeah. 
Which, uh, of course, now I'm sensitive to being that I am a uh, recent, cat daddy. Recent cat <laughs> yeah. If we got a new cat daddy in town, you and Jim, Ken you're the crazy. Overnight. You've heard of crazy cat ladies. Crazy cat man. Crazy cat man. Not by choice. You kind of were. Oh no, I don't know about they that. They forced your hand. Into the situation. I'd you like to believe that you were forced. You in, don't choose your kitties. Your kitties choose you. They're very cute. They are. Cat daddy. Um. So a specialty case, right? Specialty application. I almost call them novelty. They're not. I mean, they, they're they're legitimate, right? But they're like interestingly different. I Which like one are you talking about right now? The yeah. hypervals and the and the stingers. I feel like at what point though, like it, you're still shooting a twenty two rim fire. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Long rifle has already killed plenty of little critters and big, and yes, shockingly big at times. Um. And so, yeah, you give it a little, you snooze it up a little bit more. It's kind of, at what point do you just say, okay, let's go to the 223? Well, I mean, that depends. So, Or some other, you know, maybe the 223 is too big of a jump. But How about how about countries that don't allow people to own a centerfire? Or, maybe on something. What is this horrible place you speak or of? Or yeah. the restrictions surrounding a centerfire are astronomical. We see a huge uptick in air rifles and... 22 long rifle right and so then like we need to squeeze every drop oh, out of sure it yeah in that right? case make it work yeah or well, well and like you like you were saying earlier though like some of these are going like if you're actually trying to you know kill something like a you know varmint sized critter from a you know squirrel rabbit which i, I guess i won't consider those varmints you know those are small game let's but go like, with uh, a groundhog groundhog uh, yeah. something like that yeah that that extra juice, that extra mm -hmm. velocity, like you were saying earlier, that's going to kill differently. Yeah. The other one might kill more like, a, I guess, like almost like, like maybe like a muzzleloader in a way, just like, bloop, yep. you know, punch a hole. It's yep. going to die, you yep. know, but like it's going to be a little bit more rapid, mm -hmm. I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, with, with that higher velocity. Sure. Is that where we're seeing hollow points too? Is in that application? Kind of. Um, CCI came out with a cool hollow point, and I think that's this one. Yeah, there the, is one hollow point. We there. have one HP in there, yeah. And then there's the segmented bullets, which I think you have a couple of as well. The stingers are hollow points, though. CCI yep. stingers. So I've recovered some 22 LR projectiles out of some larger things that were hollow points, specifically mini mags, because they're like a. a Maybe that's what I'm thinking of the mini mags. Yeah. And I, I laughed because when I, I found. So we shot a mule deer with a regular rifle. <laughs> le le legal <laughs> means of take, right? Okay, got it. And um, <laughs> my hunting partner and I, and we're working through this deer, and I'm getting up to the cape, and I'm, I'm folding the cape up. He had another buck that he wanted this cape for, his beautiful cape. And on one side of the animal, there's like a, a healed over injury. And, and, of course, we thought right away, it's like, oh, it's an antler tying, right? So this is like a, a good buck, and he's probably out sparring or whatever. He probably took a tying to the neck. Um, but it was it was like a pretty interesting trauma point. And, and like, it definitely looked a little more forceful than an antler tine. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm skinning up that side of the neck and I flip them over and I'm working up the other side and my knife gets that distinct ink when it hits something metallic. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, there's something under here. And so we start skinning up, skinning up, skinning up. And here's a um, CCI mini mag uh, projectile, 40 grain copper washed hollow point. Like yeah. the most distinct 22 LR projectile, right? Besides maybe one of those calibris. And it had traversed the entirety of the neck. Um, so the, presumably, here's how it went down. The shooter, who was attempting to kill this mule deer with a 22 LR, was trying to hit him in the back of the head. Missed low. Sure. And it was, I don't know, probably three inches beneath where the, the neck and the, the um, spinal, or the, the neck and the skull join. Mm -hmm. Okay. It had traversed the thickness of the neck or the, the the diameter of the neck had poked through the muscle tissue on the other side and it had become embedded under the hide. It never exited. That bullet had zero expansion. Zero. So wow. was the wound on the f kind of like, where, where or where did you notice the wound? Then? On on one side of the neck. Like those two big, when you when you carve off your neck roast, like yeah. you've got your spine, you cut down and you just kind of like flayed off and yeah. you end up with that big roll. Yeah. So on one side of the neck, and the bullet was recovered on the other. So like Frankenstein bullets. Yeah, a little Frankenstein. Yeah. And just missed all the important things. Yep. Missed the gooey stuff. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, I extract or excise this this projectile on the other side and I'm 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 like curious to see 
what happens to a 22 LR projectile when it encounters that much hide and hair, that much muscle tissue, and maybe bone. Nothing. It looked. Wow. It looked. It, it had rifling bands on it, like the imprint imprintation of, of the rifling, and it was 100 percent completely normal. <laughs> Literally turned that thing into just ballistics gel. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. Um. So what was cool though is like, okay, well we know those hollow points are probably not actually doing what we conventionally think hollow points do. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple of others that actually do a pretty cool job and these these segmented bullets. So there's like three or four parts that are then bonded together via some means. And then upon impact, they fracture. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get these secondary projectiles from a primary. Would that, okay. Maybe I'm drawing a comparison here. That's not a comparison, but like an interlock ring. In the Hornady, would that be almost a similar thing except, or not? Except instead of it being a jacket and the ring crimping the lead core to hold the bullet together, uh-huh. coming at it like perpendicular to the, the shank and the ogive, mm-hmm. this is the length of the bullet. Uh-huh. So we have these, I'm going to call them petals, break off, and then you have a um, shank that oh. maintains penetration. Okay. Now, I've never shot anything alive with these and then done a necropsy to discover what these projectiles do. In theory, though, they work, right? So I don't think they're very strongly held together. The intent is we hit, we have then secondary projectiles, and then the shank continues to penetrate through. The idea is is just taking a, an abysmal and anemic ballistic solution for you know inducing trauma mm-hmm. and you know exacerbating the trauma. Who's making those again? CCI. Yeah, and I think there's been a couple others out there. Um, over the years that have that have done similar things hmm. um, like that um, but I've, I've never I've never uh, shot them into something that I can take apart later and look at it yeah yeah can we talk about the slow stuff again I was just about to get there myself the subsonic stuff slow it down <laughs> slow, slow down, down there partner. slow down for you everybody everybody <laughs> grab a partner and get out there on the dance floor <laughs> um, <laughs> so the subsonic stuff yeah a subsonic is a large category given to a number of various uh, cartridges sort of within it. Yeah. Because I used to, so, you know, I shoot a lot of subsonic stuff. You shoot out, you know, suppressed, unsuppressed, whatever. It's nice and quiet. That's why why I shoot it. Of course, we were talking about, you know, you can maybe get, uh, the precision guys like to have subsonic for their reasons. But, well, there, uh, certain jobs require a level of discreetness. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, but like librarians, there. Yes, the it's the cartridge of librarians. Um, okay, noted. So there's a couple of things I could have said about that, but I'll keep <laughs> it. I'm not going to go that dark. But okay, there's there's different levels of subsonic. Basically, is what I'm getting. At. Yeah, and I'll I'll give a couple of examples here that we have on the table. So we have I've got CCI. This is called uh, 22LR suppressor. Now, this is subsonic hollow point, 45 grain, 970 feet per second. Mm-hmm. This stuff, I can confirm, at least in my own uh, use case, that it is on the ragged edge of reliability in a semi-automatic platform. It still has just barely enough juice to cycle a bolt on my 22 ARs or a 1022, something along those lines. It even has a picture of a 1022, uh, seemingly, or something similar to it. Nah, it's not a 1022. Unless it was all tacked out, anyway. But it's got it's it's sort of designed to like just be able to to function those, but still be subsonic. 40, then forty five grain. It, so let me ask you this: Have you shot that without a suppressor? And how loud is it? Um, I would still say again, probably on like it. This is everything about it is being on the ragged edge of going supersonic. Okay. So like, I wouldn't love to shoot just mag dumps with it without hearing protection without mm-hmm. a suppressor but i also wouldn't be like ruined right then we have this stuff cci quiet 22 this is a 40 grain target plinking round lead round nose shooting at 710 feet per second now of course i know then as we go down we have mark super sniper stuff which we'll get into but like you can get you can get basically slower and slower and mm-hmm. then it apparently gets more and more subsonic which is that just all getting into how quiet it is? I mean, why would... Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned there's the reliability thing in some semi-automatic platforms, but at, at some point, like, 
what are you gaining by changing up where you are within the subsonic realm? Discretion. So, like, just the slower it gets, the quieter it gets, basically? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I we mean, have, it's already, have... like, this quiet 22 stuff is already so darn quiet. Oh, well, you'll take this down to the, the range later today, the Super Calibri, and you'll pull the trigger and you'll look for a malfunction in your firearm. Because, <laughs> you like, it, it didn't go off. Like, I heard that firing pin hit, and that was it. You can watch. I've shot those before. You can watch the project projectile. Yeah, that's so, fun. So it's it's so it's I would say solely discretion. Now twenty two quiet's an interesting loading. This stuff. Yeah. So it's it's structured like a CB from a velocity standpoint. The CBs shorter long are seven hundred and ten feet per second. The CBs used to be or still are rather a twenty nine grain CB bullet. Um, these are forty grain. Because one thing about CBs that are uh, kind of tough is they, they have no energy. I mean, you know, anemic, anemic, anemic energy. Right. Um, and I've used CBs for some, some pest control stuff, and you have to be like sub-20 yards, and you have to be very calculated on where you put your bullet because yeah. they have nothing um, going for them beyond that or if it's a misplaced shot. Like they don't penetrate well. Um, like you can kill a raccoon with it. It undoubtedly has to be a cranial hit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll just, you'll, you'll maim something before you do anything with it. The quiet, on the other hand, that's a 40 grain projectile at the same velocity. So we got quite a bit more mass going on here and they're quite a bit more effective. I killed a groundhog with this exact ammo, uh, ammo yep. coming out of a 1022 at, I would say 35 yards. Yep. So you're you're carrying a considerable amount more payload uh, with that that quiet load. That's a cool thing. Um, we didn't have quiets back when I shot a lot of CBs and and was doing a little bit of pest control. Um, I would have rather had quiets than CBs because mm-hmm. the CB is like you've got to really be on your game. And they don't shoot that good either. At least they never shot phenomenally well out of my gun. Um, they shot good enough to get the job done, but they weren't they weren't crazy quiets. Don't shoot very differently than my 22 LR loads out of my gun. So, like, I brought a 1022 target rifle in today that shoots quiets just dandy at 20 yards. Yeah, um, it shoots CBs okay. Yeah, and they also then have the full profile of the 22 LR. The CB short and CB long don't because they have this abbreviated bullet and then an abbreviated case. They feed very poorly out of a 1022 when you're straight pulling it. Yeah. Um, I actually modified magazines so that I could shoot 22 CB longs in a 1022 without feeding issues. Um, this would remedy that immediately. So, again, kind of an interesting, I'm going to, again, call it a novelty application. Super discreet, super quiet, like quieter than suppressed in, in a lot of different formats without giving up manual feeding reliability. Because mm-hmm. that bullet's not going to, gotcha. that, that cartridge isn't going to nosedive in there. Yeah, I've shot this with a suppressor on. I do, I do feel like, though, the noise level isn't really any different, though, than shooting this stuff with a suppressor on. Which well, is what you're holding I'm, t- I'm holding the 970 feet per second uh, 22 suppressor stuff from CCI. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting to me because it's kind of like, you know, of course, when I shot this stuff out of a 1022, I had to straight pull. It's basically yep. like a bolt action. Yep. And then when I shoot this stuff, it works. And yep. I... Like I said, it, I'm sure there is a difference. It's just that it's not as comprehensible to me as I would have anticipated. Right. So look at uh, like what a suppressor is doing, though. And and perhaps the, the quiet is intended to not use on a suppressor. Could be, yeah. And putting a suppressor on it, it doesn't have enough gas volume or velocity to really... <laughs> to really do anything. To, to quote, activate the suppressor, right? Um, so, so you end up with, with like a moot point or a net zero gain. Whereas this, suppressed, is a whole different animal. Like yeah. we're adding... 230 feet per second, um, and we're actually adding five grains of bullet weight as well. So, like, if, you, if you're looking for a solution for pest control that is even more effective, definitely this one then, right? And you have a suppressor. Yeah, correct. If you don't have a can and you have a manually operated gun or you're okay with operating your gun manually, the quiets. That makes sense. They're cool. Um, and then CBs, just because we're kind of on that tangent, like this is a CB short case. They're adorably cute. They you know, are itty bitty little things. Uh, they look like a cartoon drawing of a, a pistol case. Um, Seven hundred and ten feet per second 
uh, 29 grain projectile, they're laughable. Like they're, they're just cute. Right. Um, what next? What's did, the deal? With, I, what's it? I'm sorry, Mark. I well, just I just want to s- correct myself here because I feel like that super Calibri. I was like, oh, you can watch those, right? Yeah, I, and I, absolutely. Was I speaking out of turn there? No. Like, was I remembering? Because no. it's been a long time since I've shot those. Nope. Actually, I was trying to find some that I had at my house. I can't find them. I'm glad you had some. I bought a case. <laughs> <laughs> what What's the deal with uh, with the bullet profile on the super Calibri? It is definitely the most standout. Yeah, projectile in the lineup that we have here. So let's say other than other than of course what I think is the coolest the coolest um, cartridge on this entire table, which we'll get to, I'm sure. But uh, what's the deal with that? Let's say you had a 22 long rifle, but you didn't have a pellet gun, but you needed your 22 long rifle to do the things a pellet gun could, and that is like super discreet and intentionally short range and intentionally low mass projectile to reduce like ricochet danger. You would get a super calibri. What? Yeah, uh, probably even uh, like over penetration. <laughs> c- correct, because like a one seven seven pellet gun, moving, you know, a twenty grain pellet at twelve hundred feet per second is probably a rowdier situation than this is. Mm-hmm. So what? You're. I feel like you've described what shooting a big spider in your house or something. Pretty much. Um, so twenty grain projectile at five hundred. We're feet not per recommending second. that, by the way. No, don't shoot spiders in your house. I have shot these in my house, though. <laughs> into an appropriate backstop absolutely yes. my father will never listen to this podcast so he'll never know what happened but i used to get his ruger mark one target pistol out and yellow pages phone books tape them together and i would shoot prone pistol like in your basement or yeah something. absolutely nice with the roller carpet in the back just in case i missed sounds perfectly safe to me what up against the unfinished wall and uh, oh in no your... no that was finished well Hey, you know what? It all, I think it turned out. You're yep. still here. Yep. So they have no gunpowder at all. They have a hopped up priming compound in there. That's it. And there's also a standard Calibri, just called Calibri. Um, the, the standard Calibris are super obscure. I've never seen a box of them for sale. They are 375 feet per second or something like that. I mean, they are anemic. It's like BB gun. It's less. Yeah. You know, less like, than. And, like, that's like, that'd be like Red Rider BB gun. Yeah. Pretty much. What's, what's, the, got, what's the velocity what on a red? Here. I know. What's the velocity on a red? red right give that a give that a Google. Yeah. So these are these are twenty grainers at five hundred feet per second. That's fun. They they have enough gas for dispatching chipmunks, squirrels at very close range with well placed shots, um, mice, uh, nuisance birds like house sparrows, English sparrows, that kind of thing, um, starlings. Um, I've killed pigeons with them. I may have dispatched a raccoon with one. Um, I, I, I'd have to like think way back. We might've been right on 350 feet per second for the, uh, that's what a red rider's putting out. Yeah. I'd love to know what a standard, um, one seven, seven steel BB weighs in grains. Oh yeah. That would be interesting. Hmm. Okay. I'm not going to say that we did it, but if one were to shoot a red rider inside of this podcast studio at a piece of cardboard, you'd punch a hole in the cardboard and then it'd be stopped by this large canvas here against the wall. Yeah. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Now, they, they are a little louder out of a pistol than a pellet gun, but not much. Yeah. So, like, I, I've shot them in my yard out of my uh, Ruger, and, like, you, you hear something. You don't know what that something is. Yeah, was it somebody stepping on a stick? Yeah. 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 So, like, the audit of that auditory... Uh, you know, stimulation would not be immediately turned towards that was a firearm. Right. It was like that could have been somebody stomping a pop can, um, dropping something. Don't know. Um, accuracy is not great once you get past a certain distance. And if you look at the bullet, it's like a goofy projectile. It looks like if you took a standard pointed pellet for a, a pellet gun and then squished it. Mm-hmm. It's just wider. And uh, for th- for those listening, not watching... Um, it has, it has a silly point on it. It looks like the ha- the the pointed end of like a 16D nail. That's about it. Yeah. What have we got here? Mark is Mark's bringing up some um, internets. Point five is, five grains, five and a half grains for a steel pellet. One of those little BBs out of the red yeah. rider. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'd say it has an edge over the the rider on mass. Yeah, it's a smidge. Right. Uh, but they're cool. They're super super neat. And if you've got a gun that, you know, shoots them decently to a short distance, um, they're a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. 
can we, we talk? Can we talk about the sniper yeah, subsonics? Yeah, we have to now. So that's my favorite. It's cool. It's, it's my favorite on the table. I like them. I bought a I bought a case of them. Yep. Out of the Cabell's bargain cave a while ago. Still got back, a whole bunch, don't back, you? <laughs> back when that was a thing. Yeah. Uh, it's comical looking. Yeah, they're goofy. The bullet is about twice as long as the case. Yep. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> It's huge. It's the same length as a standard 22 LR uh, cartridge loaded up, yep. but it has the case of a 22 short. Yep. It's exactly what it has. So 60 grain lead round nose. 60 grain. Yeah. Bigger than some 223s. Yep. 60 grain lead round nose. What do we got here, Mark? And it's uh, it's affixed to yeah. a 22 short case. Maxima, oh, sorry. Maxima Precision. That's nice that they write it in other languages too. And that's what it says on the box. I mean, is that what this is used for? Is this is it's called? It has sniper on the box. Mm-hmm. Is it used for hyper accuracy or is it used for like? Uh, oh hunting? lord, is this used for professional work? Oh, can we talk? Is this is this going to get darker than we anticipated? Okay, there are in some places professionals who use. I can definitively state yes. He can't. Yeah. Does that make me a sniper? Since I own, I, mean, I got a lot of them. Bit of a sniper myself. <laughs> I'm a sniper myself. <laughs> um, so the idea is here as much uh, penetrating power on target as possible. Very discreet. They're very discreet. They're very quiet. Not a but, tremendous distance. I'm imagining. Um. Or well, the thing is, if you get the right twist rate on your bullet um, or on your barrel, yes. What is the right yeah, twist well, rate? Yeah, what would Ryan? that be with the uh, lightness? One in eight, one in nine, one in ten. Instead of one in sixteen, one in eighteen. Oh, we're almost yeah. We're, we're starting to approach more like the AR yep. uh, territory because we have a sixty grain projectile here. Yeah. Um, what kind of what kind of twenty two LR guns can you find with that type of twist rate? Non factory, but you can get drop in barrels for say. Ruger 1022s that have integral suppressors on them. <laughs> um, you can get some AR-22 barrels done that way. There's a couple of uh, rimfire barrel manufacturers out there that have um, increased twist rate speeds. Right. Um, that work. And what's, then, what's the velocity on yeah, that one, Sage? Uh, if I remember correctly, 900, say on the box, 910 feet per second, I think is what that loading is. Okay. My goodness, out of that case, though? I mean, that's that's Is it jammed impressive. with powder? Is, that like, is there like, are they maxing out that short... That short case. I don't know that I've ever pulled one apart. We can. I don't know. It's a tool. Like a sin. I know. It's kind he's, of He's got a lot of them. Uh, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, um, pull up the MV on the, yeah. The MV? Muzzle, Muzzle velocity. Oh. Oh, they got those babies healed in there. Notable. I have an almost 90 degree bend in this and it's still not coming out. Wow. I need another tool. It hurts my fingers. Um, so, yeah. Well, now your back's going to hurt because you just scraped landscaping duty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. That is such a giant bullet. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty much pretty much full to the heel of the bullet. They've got it pretty much full. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Compare it, when you dump it, dump it next to the, uh, the I other need to one. Get, yeah, I need to get some of these. So for a thing. Yeah, I mean, do. you can, you can, you can get some increased twist rate bullets. Oh my gosh, it's yeah, there's it's actually good. even almost more different powder though. So if we're yeah. looking, oh well, yeah, yeah, that's right. I forget about that. If we're looking at these powder charges here, the one that came out of the um, that AR tactical load is a different powder. I don't know what they are. Um, a lot of that powder is pretty specialty. I know some of the hand loading manuals are talking about using powders like tight group, um, and, and other pistol powders, uh, that are pretty fast, but I don't know what they are. You can't really reliably look at a powder and be like, it's mm. definitively this, um, yeah. there's like a chemical analysis that has to go into that. But so th- uh, this is very interesting to me. So it's giving us, uh, muzzle velocity. Uh, so it's giving us figures at, at the muzzle and figures at 100 yards. Mm-hmm. So at, at the muzzle, it's going 950 feet per okay, second. 950, all right. Impressive. Uh, close. With 120 foot-pounds of energy. Which is significant. Which is significant. Interesting. This is where it gets interesting for me. 
uh, at a distance of 100 yards, 848 feet per second, 96 foot-pounds of energy. My gosh. It didn't lose much. It didn't lose much. No, and, and we've talked about this in the in the 300 Blackout podcast as well, where when when you don't hit that transonic barrier and that bullet isn't breaking amazingly with like wind resistance and, and air resistance and um, transonic instability, you maintain velocity for a long time. So run some figures on like a 208 grain uh, bullet out of a 300 Blackout leaving the muzzle at 1040 it loses very little velocity at 100, 200, 300 yards. Like like disproportionately small amounts of velocity relative to distance. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's maintaining it. And that's what makes subsonics so cool when they're done right. Um, yeah, the first time I ever shot a 300, it was a, well, not a 300 blackout, it was a 300 whisper um, was the official thing. So 300 slash 221. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the first thing that we noticed is how much punch it had at distance, like, and at exceptional distances, two and 300 yards. Completely counterintuitive. Absolutely. It, it defies logic. Like, when I look at, at some of my fast shooting center fires, they strip hundreds of feet per second off. Mm. You know, even from muzzle to 100 or muzzle to 200, a lot of subsonics lose tens of feet per second because we're not hitting that giant air break. While we're flying, yeah, I've yeah. never I've never done this before, and, and probably there's people out here or out there, hi everybody, that have <laughs> and that know a lot more about this. But I, I guess I've never really thought about it in that way. But in relation to like an arrow, mm-hmm. like I'd be curious to chrono like whatever my bow at. Oh yeah, at a hundred yards. At, oh yeah, and see or at hundred or, or even fifty. Yeah, and there's you know? there's there's actually really and see what the difference is between like essentially at the bow, you know. There's really cool data out there about that because people are doing it now and they're using those um, radar chronographs like the lab radar oh, like, okay, yeah. mm-hmm. and they're staging them at, at different distances and they're firing their bow and they're losing tens of feet per second. Tens. Hmm. Yeah. Which is signi- like when you're dealing with something let's say we'll just round numbers 300 feet per second. Yeah. Like you know 10 feet per second I mean that's a significant it's a game percentage of percentages. but it's like yeah. It's I don't know. Smart when you but say but maybe not as much as you would think. Correct. Though. Yeah. If if you're launching at 300 feet per second and you're impacting target at say 80 yards at 273 feet per second, you look at that and be like, "Wow, that's really efficient." Right. Um, I did not lose a lot. That's it's really cool. Like super cool. Um, but yeah. So the design intent behind this cartridge is very quiet, suppressed, payload delivery. Very much so. Yeah. Ryan, do we have okay? Well, a CB long would just be a conical ball. In the long, long case. In the long case. Mm-hmm. Okay. 22 tracers. Sure. That sounds fun. Yeah, that sounds They're, really they're a hoot. Fun. Yeah. A little bit of a fire hazard, but they're a hoot. <laughs> be careful out there. You can get them in green or red. Yeah, fire hazard, whatever. Um, And then maybe this doesn't fall. Maybe this is something different. 22 WMR That's pistol. a Winchester Magnum Rimfire, which is a completely different thing. Okay. So a 22, well, there's WRF, Winchester Rimfire, and then there's WMR, Magnum Rimfire. That's the one that people compare sometimes to like FN57. Yeah. Right? Yep. Different case, different diameter, not interchangeable. So you can't put a WMR in your long rifle. You can't safely put a long rifle in your WMR. Now, there's a couple of rigs out there, like Ruger makes a, uh, a cool pistol called a single six convertible where you pop the WMR cylinder out of its revolver and you put a long rifle cylinder in it. Mm -hmm. The cylinder is the chamber because they have different chamber dimensions and different case diameters. It allows you to shoot, but same bullet diameter or nominally different bullet diameter. It allows you to shoot 22 long rifles out of the same gun, so to speak, um, as you could 22 Winchester Magnum rimfire, but you're changing the chamber element, the, the cylinder in this case. Um, but it's also a, a notably longer case, like notably longer, like, you know, okay, pl- plus 25 or 30% hmm. case length. Yeah. Much better suited for larger critter dispatching. Um, and I actually, I think there may be a state that allow you to hunt big game with them. Wait, what? Gasp. Yeah. I'm going to have to look into that one, but I honestly think in the Northeast, you can do that somewhere. It sounds so Northeast. Yeah. <laughs> I have to double check that. I've talked to a couple guys that, that kill hogs with a great deal of proclivity, and they tell me that a WMR is a pretty effective hog gun. Um, you Shocking. Know. Yeah. Yeah. 
We don't well, have. Is it though? Because I mean, I, I always go back. Is you're like, oh yeah, twenty two. You talk about it. It's always like diminutive and small and for kids. And then you're like two twenty three, man. I'll tell you what. And it's like, well, all right. With it, you go to WMR, you make the case capacity bigger. You're still mm-hmm. shooting about the same. You know, it's like, well. Maybe so. Yeah. I was, was going to ask one, another question, but I'm actually going to save it because it's an entirely different podcast. I don't even want to get into it right now. I, I, I'm so fired up, I'll throw my pen. If wow. you're watching on YouTube, Across I just the room. I just threw my pen. Uh, just had an AD with the pen. Um, <laughs> damn, you guys. Um, I think that's first desk pop here. Um, go ahead. Anything else? Because I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to finish. Well, I'm going to close with one other type of 22. That we haven't Ryan covered. Has, Ryan has entered into the ballistics calc here, so we're going to see what he yeah what he what got. He spits out. Um, Twenty-two WMR, so standard loading from Federal forty grain full metal jacket, nineteen hundred and ten feet per second. Right. So right. We, we picked up seven hundred feet per second. But it's an entirely different thing. It's yeah. almost it'd be like saying like it, it'd be like comparing it to like a twenty-two mag or something, right? Well, that or is no? a twenty-two mag. Oh, okay. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> So welcome back, Mark. Yeah, well, still a rimfire, still a twenty-two rimfire, different twenty-two rimfire. What's your close? Birdshot. <laughs> you stole my thunder. He knew it. No, it was it really your close. Yes. All That's right, we'll edit this talk. out. We'll edit it out. No, it's it's fantastic. So the twenty-two birdshot, two different kinds. You've got kind of like what I, at least from what I've seen, you've got like the CCI with the plastic little bubble plastic containing number. Is it twelve? Ten and twelve. Or they used to have nine too, I think, but ten and twelve. I'm gonna, and uh, then there's like a crimped version where mm-hmm. it's just, just the case that's crimped closed yep. and it contains the shot. Yep. Looks like a blank. Very small, like I said, very small shot. Uh, very close range work. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's for shooting spiders in your house. Mm-hmm. Like guys talk about like doing like oh I've got rats in the barn like you know like I don't want to damage my tin roof or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or a garden gun. Or a garden gun. So. Yes, let's talk about shooting those through a rifled barrel, but also, more specialty, Ryan, smoothbore barrels yeah. designed for it. Mark is bubbling with excitement right now. I'm pumped up, because this, uh, this is, in my <laughs> hope, going to lead, and we'll ask the listeners if they want to hear about it. If you've listened this far into this podcast, at least an hour 12, unedited, you're probably really into 22s, so maybe you'll want to see this. Uh, comment below. It's um, Trent. He's the only one left. Thanks, Trent. Hey, Trent. Uh, anyway, okay, let's go through rifled versus smoothbore with this style of twenty-two shot ammo. Okay, so Mark alluded to two different styles, what I call capsule and crimp. Capsule is literally a blue, thin plastic containing a diminutive scoop of shot. And I mean, it's anemic. Um... And then crimp is just, if you've ever seen like a, a 22 long rifle or a nail gun blank that they use for nail sets into concrete, it's like it's like a star crimp on the end of the case that holds in that shot. Um, when I had started shooting this stuff, I was under the impression that the capsule shot was going to shoot the best because it looked like there was less goofing around, right? There was like this little wad thing or, or cup thing over the top of it, like you'd shoot it like fragment into a million pieces and then the shot would come out it looks more finished yeah correct unquestionably the crimp stuff was better Hmm. like absolutely the opposite of what i thought like no question um through a rifle barrel you can do it it's it borderlines useless past a few feet um like really and and i i've never i've never i don't i've never seen a norway rat by the way in the wild um, I've had pet rats, but I've never seen a Norway rat in the wild. Like from the pet store or you found it? No, like at a pet, pet store. Okay. I, I had lab rats. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they were great pets. Anyway. Let's introduce it to Jim's cats. Um, yeah, lab rat might take a cat. You'd be surprised. What, six cats? No, that's true. <laughs> that's yeah, because it's would all you, Would you rather it's fight one? It's all jacked one, up on lab experiments. Would you rather fight one cat-sized rat or six rat-sized cats? Um <laughs> You spin on that for a little while. Yeah. Uh, so, it, like, very, very, very abysmal performance past a few feet out of the rifled barrel. Um, so what's happening is as that shot column's moving down there, it's also rotating. The second it leaves the muzzle, those projectiles just go whatever direction they want, mm-hmm. right? So a- as they come out and that shot column's rotating, 
you leave the the confines and the security of the bore, and that shot just spins wildly out of control. Um, and, and the patterning is horrible. Um, and the projectiles are so small, like a number 10 or a number 12 shot. I think 12 is 2,250 pellets per ounce. So we're talking like, I don't even know what the charge weight is on a... Sand. Yeah, it is. It's pocket sand. It's absolutely pocket sand um, through a rifled barrel. Now, through a smooth bore, they're still not great, but they're probably like 10 times better. Hmm. Um, so a good friend of mine, his grandfather at, a, I think, a Ducks Unlimited banquet won this really cool gun called the Remington 572 Fieldmaster. And he called me. He's like, you need to come over and look at this 22 because it shoots like crap. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So I, I go over there, and he's got standard 22 long rifle. And I notice that, like, the second he, he's got it on a bench or whatever and some sandbags, it has no sights. It has a bead on the front. Yeah. And he's like, it's putting bullets sideways through there. I'm like, is that a smooth bore? And he goes, what? And I look at it. It's his 22 LR shot. So it's a smooth bore gun, pump action, cool as heck. Um, and yeah, you shoot shot. It was designed for shooting shot. It's a garden gun. Um, and for dispatching, you know, gophers or, you know, butterflies or dragonflies or what, like whatever you have. Um my hunting partner called his his butterfly gun, which he, he's never killed a butterfly. Oh, he would not do that. that terrible. It's thing. it's funny to think about. I shot a dragonfly so out of the air with my uh, BB gun one time. That's pretty cool. About That's impressive. Yards. Yeah. Um, but hit him, hit him in the wing. The the design intent there is dispatching of, of vermin inside of enclosures, like Mark had alluded to the tin barn. You put a hole in your barn. You get water on your feed. Your feed molds. Your animals get sick, and you you know you lose yield, right? So you got to kill the vermin that live in there, but you don't want to poke a hole in the barn. You then use you know rat shot or snake shot, as it's called, or just bird shot. Yeah, um, yeah. This is fact, I'm looking at the CCI stuff right here. You know, 20 rounds per box, size 12 shot, 22 long rifle caliber, 31 grains, I guess of shot. shot. Um, it says ideal for close to medium range pest control. Consistent patterns. It says, yeah. uh, hunting species environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now the other cool thing about twenty-two shot. What's Mark, that, Ryan? Well, you want me to just roll into it? Yeah. It's called mosquito. You know, like mosquito, but mosquito. Um, so imagine if you had this cool gun, the pump action, twenty-two smooth bore, smooth bore, with a bead front. It's kind of like having a, a shotgun yes. in in essence but scaled way down. Now, it wouldn't be very good to go out and shoot, you know, clay birds with because clay birds are pretty big and they fly really fast and you're usually shooting them at like 20, 40 yards. But what if you scaled that down too and you had this this 25% size thrower that threw these tiny little, you know, charcoal clay pigeons and you wanted to shoot it in your garage or your backyard. You would have invented what's called mosquito. And you could even get a Ritz cracker adapter for it. So this is a thing. It's a real thing. Um, it was, I don't know how popular it was. it was. This goes along the lines of gallery shooting, you know, where you see the, like the pigs, the chickens, and the rams, and they had like the, the 22 that was tethered to the counter, and you go to the bar, and you put your nickel on the counter, and you, you go see how many of those pigs, chickens, or rams you could knock down. Well, they had mosquito too. Um, so tiny little thrower <clears throat> whips this tiny little clay pigeon. You've got your pump action 22 smooth bore. You break that clay bird in the air, mosquito. When they had faded in popularity, um, presumably in favor of these galleries getting shut down and people actually shooting real skeet, a couple of folks made cracker adapters. So a little sleeve that goes in the track of the throwing arm that would then fit and accept a standard Ritz cracker. So now it's, it's also a snack and it's a good time. Do we have one of these? Not yet. Not yet. We've been meaning to talk to you about that, actually. <laughs> Let me know when we get one. We got to build one. Oh, we might need some welding, Jim. Okay, I get it. <laughs> oh, no, I get it. It's cool. Uh, you learn one skill, and now everybody just uses it for their own pleasure. That's fine. Well, you get to come too. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. I think I'm in. Uh, it just to me, it seems like just the if done in a safe, controlled manner, like the absolute best yard game. Ever. You could have. Bocce ball, never heard of it. Handle. No. 
Now, I imagine since, like, you know, long jarts got outlawed, can't have those anymore. I loved that game as a kid, too. Uh, I mean, you're basically throwing little miniature spears across the yard. I didn't know they got outlawed. Oh, yeah. I don't think Shut them down. Yeah. You, huh? Yeah, you don't yep. get those anymore. Nope. They can't produce them. I'd love to find you, like a set of those garage too. Sale. Yes, we can. We can make those too. We got a, I guess. We got a 3D not? printer and a lathe. We can, we can, <laughs> we can bring <laughs> this to a new level. We're gonna get in the illegal lawn lawn charts business. Get some Swiss, black market Swiss lawn charts. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, dude, this game just sounds absolutely amazingly fun, and it's like you don't need. Like, it's not going that far. No, 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 like no. Like, they run out of gas. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. It's sand. You're shooting sand. I think I've seen bigger sand than 12 shot. <laughs> you have. Yeah. Yes. It, it, and, uh, yeah, Mark has approached me with exactly two business propositions in my time of knowing him. One was buying an oyster farm in Alaska, which actually we should have done. <laughs> I don't think so. In hindsight... The ever the the guy that I talked to was like, he basically told me that I, he's like, why don't you just take your money and light it on fire? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, but I don't know, man. Well, I still actually, don't know. These days, it literally might light on fire with all these people burning down food production facilities. So yeah. this is true. So he's going to live off oysters. Targeting oysters. I don't know. Like soon, yeah. it seemed like, hey, you go to the stores. The oysters are they're expensive. Well, Mark Mark's like, we got to buy this oyster farm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, remember the I, hadn't, was. I hadn't consulted my wife yet. Oh, yeah. but uh, And the second the one was reproduction mosquito fields. I'm in. Dude, Dude I'm you in. You can't. We'll edit that out. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's in. But you know what's nice about it? Now we can say patent pending. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that ought to do it. Totally locked up. Yeah. My uh, my legal counsel, everybody. Uh, yeah, Mosquit. Comment below if you want to see us dive in to the world of Mosquit and we- make Mosquit great again. I'm so in. I'm in. Let's get the guns. That's dude, the hardest part. There's three people that are I'm, in. Dude, I'm telling you right now, Mark has had me bird dog in this project. Even I look for him. For years. I know for a fact you found some. It's just that. I did. The barrier to entry is absurd. They are, there's like so few. Yeah. Now, okay, time out. Let's just. The Henry lever action garden gun in production right now. They yeah. make them. Do you want a lever action? That's the yes. problem. Not for, not What's, for, not for, loves not for, a lever action. not for shotgunning, quotation mark. What? It's a lever gun. What's wrong with that? Jim, I want you don't to think. Tell, don't l- tell me something's wrong with no, a lever gun. No, it's not that. Nothing's wrong with I a lever gun. I own lever gun. guns. I'm not saying that. I want you to just imagine yourself up there, crowd behind you, the Ritz cracker hopper is full. I you, know. You get up there, pull, bird comes out, and it's a double. You go like this and no. then try to, no. It's pull, just like For, that. No, For the application think- of just your general yard work. Fantastic. Yeah. You Great go, tool for the job. You want to go pop a 12-line ground squirrel? Absolutely. You want to shoot mosquito? Look, I'm going to try to just give you the best competitive advantage I can. It's, I watched Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The things he can do with a a revolver, it, and you're, you're going to complain about having two hands on the gun, and, oh, i got to manipulate a lever to hit some Ritz crackers. I'm a clay oh, snob. Well, woe is you. I, it's like there's, there's, there's a, uh, a gentleman component to it. In fact, you have to wear tweeds and a hat. Any hat will do. You guys but, are a bunch of <laughs> ninnies. Or shorts and sandals. That's or fine. shorts and flip-flops. Totally that's fine. fine, too. I don't own flip-flops, but that's fine. It's kind of the same thing when like we're, we talk about going grouse hunting, and then Ryan's like, oh, you're bringing a synthetic 12-gauge. That is illegal. No, it's not. It is in the book of grouse hunting. You're shooting a, at a bird that can't even fly, <laughs> to my knowledge. <laughs> How's your neck? That's a joke. Just wondering what it was like walking around with your head kinked up and your nose in the air so much. All right. You know what? That's good enough. We'll we'll get a couple of these inbound. Mark, I've got a plan. Fine. We have a plan, everybody. It's like I the- said, comment below if you want to see our plan come to fruition. I know I do. I think we're just going to do it anyway, hopefully. Uh did we cover everything that we could cover on twenty two LR ammo? You'll never uh, cover it all. We covered a lot. 
what do you know? What didn't we cover? I know you guys know a lot about this. What do you know? Always love that comment section. Light it up. Yeah, hit us up, man. We want to hear it. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everyone. We're fighting now. We'll catch you on the next one. It's real this time. Keep shooting your 22s. See ya. Bye. We're We're not fighting. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.